Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our Wednesday night class. Nice to see everybody. We are studying tonight Parashat Beha Lotcha, and we would like to thank tonight's sponsor, Janice Kinov, who, Be'ezrat Hashem, should have a refuah shlema with the upcoming surgery. We shall pray and may the merit of the of uh, the Torah study tonight be for the merit and the speedy recovery and the successful successful recovery of Chava Bas Liba. Amen. So this week we're studying Parashat Ba'alotcha. We're going to study, we'll start with studying Rabbi Arlib Heyman's amazing novelty on this week's Parsha. And he tells us that last week, <clears throat> the Torah tells us about all of the princes of each tribe, the leader of each tribe, and how they each had their own day of dedicating the service in the Mishkan. These were the inaugural days of the of the in, uh, of the of the Mishkan, the very first twelve days that they're in action, and each tribe had their day to dedicate all of the service that was going to be conducted on that day. Right after that, and that's in this week's Torah portion, the Torah tells us Aaron's obligation to light the menorah on a daily basis. So we go from what the Princes of each tribe did to the obligation, the necessity of Aaron lighting the menorah on a daily basis. Rashi now asks, <clears throat> what does one have to do with another? Why is the lighting of the menorah something that comes right after the leaders of all the tribes' inaugural dedication to the Mishkan? And Rashi answers, because Aaron saw all the other princes dedicating their part and he wanted a part in it he felt left out he felt down he felt like he was unable to partake in it he wasn't even asked to partake in it explains rashi hashem came over to him hashem sensed aaron's feelings and he said do not worry even though you were not asked to partake in that, and even though there was no representative of the tribe of Levi even, the 12 other princes were from the other 11 tribes because Yosef was split, split into Ephraim and Menashe. Hashem tells Aaron, don't feel bad. Your portion is greater than theirs because you light the menorah, period. That's what Rashi says. Your portion is greater than theirs because you light the menorah. <clears throat> Rulev says, what's, what's Rashi saying? What does Hashem mean by your portions greater than theirs because you like the menorah? Facts are, why is it that Aaron and the Shevet Levi and the tribe of Levi did not partake in bringing any of the korbanot during the inauguration of the Mishkan? Point blank. Why were they left out? So, <clears throat> Rulev says he wants to Share a deep thought with us. Beautiful thought. Blabe says, <clears throat> there are many forms of atonement. The famous Midrash in Yalkut Shimoni is famously known, and I quote, it was posed to wisdom. What happens to someone who sins? Wisdom answered, Chata'im Tirdof Ra'ah that horrible things will chase that one who sins. And then they asked, Nivua, prophecy, what happens to one who sins? And prophecy answered, A person who sins must die. Then they came and asked Torah, Torah, what happens to a person who, who sins? Oh, Yavi Asham V'itchaperlo. Let the sinner bring a sacrifice and that'll provide atonement. And finally, the Midrash says we was, it was posed to Hashem himself. What happens to one who sins? And Hashem says, teshuva Let him do teshuva and that will give him his atonement. So Rebleib, now, in light of this famous Midrash, we've spoken about this Midrash many times over the past years of you learning with me on a weekly basis. But Rebleib now 
gives a new spin. I think it's nice. So we've seen this so many times now to feel it, to hear a new spin on it. As follows. <clears throat> the beginning of the book of Leviticus starts with the famous verse. Let me open up that so you can follow. <clears throat> Here we go. Okay. Leviticus 1 1. Vaikral <clears throat> Moshe. And he called to Moses. And the Lord spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, You see this word Lemor over here? Saying, that's an extra word. And Rashi points that out. Rashi says that word is unnecessary, but there's a reason for it. Rashi says that Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu to go and ask something or tell something to Bnei Israel, and to come back and report back if they've accepted it or not. Go ask Bnei Israel and then come back to Hashem and report what their answer was. Rashi, however, did not tell us what Hashem asked Moshe to ask the Jewish people. Reb Leib says, based on this Midrash, you know what Moshe was commanded to ask B'nai Israel If they would like that korbanot, that sacrifices, would be their preferred method of atonement. We just learned there's many ways of atonement. But Hashem asked Moshe Rabbeinu, go ask B'nai Israel if korbanot will be their preferred method of atonement. And indeed, Bnei Israel came back saying yes. And Moshe Rabbeinu went to Hashem and told him yes. And that's why the Midrash said, Torah answers, bring a korban and you will be atoned. Even though we see Hashem has another answer, and that's Teshuva. But when the Torah poses a question, Rabbi Leib explains, and the Torah gives an answer, that is a chiddish in the Torah. So according to Torah, Bnei Israel were asked, do you want this to be your preferred method of atonement? And indeed, they said yes. Based on this, Reb Leib can now say, when the princes inaugurated the Mishkan, they did so with all types of korbanot. Sin offerings, burnt offerings, peace offerings. They brought them all on the Mizbeach, all on the altar. And that served as an atonement for the entire nation. But for the tribe of Levi and the Kohanim, they were not included in any of those korbanot. None of those sacrifices were for them. They were on a different level, a higher level. Hashem commanded them to be elevated and to separate themselves from the rest of the Jewish people. Rebleib quotes multiple sources of the obligation for the Kohanim and Shevet Levi to be separated from the rest. I'm not going to go through all of them, but at least I'll, I'll, we'll go through some. Look at Exodus chapter 28, verse 1. And you, Moshe, bring Aaron close to your brother and his children amongst Bnei Israel and serve me. And then their names. Elsewhere, look chapter 28 and Exodus verse 3. To sanctify him, that he'll serve me. Also in the book of Numbers, chapter 8, verse 6, take the, the Levites from amongst B'nai Israel and cleanse them. In Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse 1, the, Levi, the, the, the Levitic Kohanim, the entire tribe of Levi, shall have no portion of the inheritance of Israel. Why? Because they are different. They are set aside. Reb Leib tells us that there's a very strong connection between the greatness of the Kohanim and the lighting of the menorah. And we see this not only here, but we see it elsewhere. We see it in the Parashat Titzaveh, in the book of Exodus, Right after Aaron and his children are established to be Kohanim, the lighting of the menorah is mentioned right after. 
This week, again, in Parashat Be'alotcha, the, the parasha starts with the lighting of the menorah, and then the consecration of the Levites is mentioned. What's the, what's the association? Answer is, this is what Hashem is telling Aaron. Your responsibility is greater than the responsibility of the princes, the leaders of all the tribes. Your tribe, the tribe of Levi, is greater and set aside from the rest of the tribes. You and your descendants have something very special to do, and that's to light the menorah on a daily basis. And that lighting, the menorah will shine on the rest of the nation. Because, again, you're set aside at a higher standard. The responsibility of the nation, Hashem is telling Aaron, is resting on your shoulders. The menorah which is lit alludes to the wisdom of Torah, which illuminates the lives of the Jews all over the world. So for you, the Kohanim, Hashem tells Aaron, it isn't enough to post facto atone for one's sins by bringing a korban. Rather, you need to light up the entire nation with Torah and mitzvot. That's the significance of the menorah. And that's why Rashi tells tells us that Hashem is being told, Hashem tells Aaron, Shelcha gedola mishalahem. Your portion is greater than their portion. Your portion, Aaron, is greater than the portion of the princes. The rest of B'nai Israel, the rest of the tribes, their avoda, their service is reactive. They sin, they atone to make up for their sins. But Shevet Levi, the tribe of Levi, the Kohanim, are proactive. They need to be on the constant spread of Torah and mitzvot. And then they are able to serve later on as messengers for Am Yisrael to do the korbanot. All of the korbanot that were brought in the Beit HaMikdash were on behalf of Am Yisrael. The Kohanim and the Leviim, which were set aside from the rest, they were able to be the perfect messengers. So now Leib says, by the Torah giving this auspicious mitzvah of lighting the menorah to Aaron, the Torah is hinting to the partnership that Moshe and Aaron had together in providing Torah and giving the Torah to the Jewish people. Rebbe writes, for a long time, I had a very difficult mo- time understanding why we refer to the Torah as Torah Moshe. Wasn't it Aaron, who was the mouthpiece, the spokesperson of Av Moshe Rabbeinu, ever since they ever since their journey started, from Paro and all the way out, it would make sense that Aaron would also have a part in this Torah study and Torah dissemination to the Jewish people. One hint is that the portions and and so the answer is yes, of course Aaron has a portion in it. And one hint is because the portions of the Torah of Dinim, of laws, is right next to the laws of the Mizbeach. And that teaches us, the Talmud says, that the Sanhedrin should be sitting right in or right on the side of the, Miz, of, of the Beit HaMikdash. So it would be together. But now the Torah is also giving us another hint. You see, the Talmud refers to the Torah as Rahmana. Rahmana means merciful. And it's so shocking that the Torah is referred to as merciful. But the one who gave the Torah to the Jewish people was Moshe Rabbeinu, who was, seemed the opposite way. He wasn't chesed. He was more deen. He wasn't an act of loving kindness. He was more judgment. He killed the Mitzri. He fought with Korach. Or defended himself against Korach. He conquered Sichon and Og. Moshe was deen. Whenever Moshe learned from Hashem, it was called, he learned mipi ha from the mouth of, of, of judgment, of strength. Moshe's, Moshe's relationship, Moshe's trait was, was more deen than chesed. So why then is the Torah referred to as Rahmana, the merciful one? Answer is, this is where we see Aaron's partnership. Aaron's partnership with Moshe was his peace, his joy, and rectified 
their ancestor Levi's sin in the, in the city of Shechem, which was Din. So since Shevet Levi has a strong portion of spreading the Torah, their mitzvah, Aaron's mitzvah, was to light the candles to illuminate and be part of the Torah. The Israel, the rest of the nations had the korbanot. The rest of the tribe, sorry, had the korbanot. And the tribe of Levi had, and, the, and specifically the Kohanim, had the lighting of the menorah. Lighting of the menorah refers to, alludes to the Torah, because just as Torah is something which protects and provides and saves, Torah does as well. And just as Torah is illuminating, that's exactly what a menorah is. This isn't, however, and, and Rebbe bends off with this, this isn't the first time the Torah writes about korbanot followed by the lighting of the menorah. In Parshat Emor, in the book of Leviticus, we have the holiday sacrifices. Then, immediately following that is the lighting of the candle, again, of the menorah. So what's this idea of korbanot and then, and then menorah over and over? So, <clears throat> Rebbe says that we know a very, very known concept that the greater the person, the harder the fall. The taller the person, the bigger the person, the harder the fall. And the greater the person, the more responsibility they have. And the more or the more severe the punishment will be if they do wrong. They're judged more stringently. A couple examples. Nadav and Avihu, they were killed on the day of the inauguration of the Mishkan for a a hairline sin in regards to either disrespecting the Beit HaMikdash or Moshe Rabbeinu. Hairline, something that if we would have done, we would nothing would happen. The Kohanim of the city of Nov, they were killed. Why? Because of a sin of not keeping Shabbat unintentionally, they had a question how to do something. They did it because they were told wrong. They went and they asked the Bet Din Hagadol. The Bet Din Hagadol told them to do it a certain way and that was wrong. And they were still all killed. Why? Because they were at a very high level. They were killed for Shabbat Bishogeg. The Hashemunayim, who saved Bnei Israel. And in their marriage, Ben Israel kept Torah and mitzvot and the continuation of the service of the of the sacrifices and offerings were brought in the Beit HaMikdash. How great were the Chashmonaim? Yet they were all killed because they took kingship for themselves when they when it was not theirs. They were not worthy of it. Therefore, explains Reb Leib, that Ben Israel need to bring Korbanot to atone. That's their method. And then right after, it's always brought down. You know what the method of the Kohanim is? How they atone? Their obligation is to light the menorah. That's their avoda. That's their service. Which is, as we said, illuminating the Jewish world with light and with Torah. The Rambam writes, we know this, that Yaakov Avinu set aside Levi, his son, to sit and learn Torah and to teach. This is what Hashem's mission was for the tribe of Levi in Egypt, on their way out of Egypt, and in the land of Israel forevermore. The Rambam writes, anyone who dedicates themselves to Torah, to learning Torah, to teaching Torah, has the status of a Levi and a Kohen. If we want to be a light on our surroundings, inspire, invigorate others, we have to not only learn Torah, we have to share Torah. We have to enlighten others with Torah. So it's, it's a very fine line between learning and sharing. It's just you have to learn it good enough that you're able to share it. You're going to have to make it practical. It's just a little bit more thinking. 
It's less just flipping through pages and, and pounding classes and more contemplating, thinking about it, making it make sense to you, and then being able to go and share it. That's the point. We all have that idea. We don't have, unfortunately, sacrifices on Korbanat anymore nowadays. We don't have the Beit HaMikdash. But Hashem tells Aaron, Shelcha gedola mishalahem. Your portion, illuminating the menorah, igniting the flame, passing over the torch, spreading Torah, is greater than all korbanot can possibly be. Kodesh Baruch Hu bless us. That we learn Torah, understand Torah, retain it, share it, illuminate others and others' lives and families with Torah. Amen, amen.